Uh, thanks a lot, Nathan. So, um, hi everyone. Um, I think Nathan introduced me for now, but uh, um, just to confirm, I work for, for RACO and we specialize in uh, looking at new techniques in machine learning and, and quantum computing for, for drug discovery specifically. So I thought I would give you a talk about this uh, today. And it, I think it's going to be a bit special compared to your other talks because we'll mostly be talking about uh, the drug discovery pipeline. And I'll only be using machine learning and AI as examples of sort of new techniques that are emerging in this field. Uh, so it's meant to be uh, fairly high level. Um, it's very introductory level at uh, sort of for drug discovery for the drug discovery pipeline and by no means it is trying to be exhaustive so really it's to give you intuition about how it works and where we see sort of prospects for these new technologies so one thing that's important to note from the beginning is the distinction between in vivo in vitro and in silico so these are types of uh, tests and experiments that can be done as part of the drug discovery pipeline in vivo means uh, experiments on live living organism in vitro is controlled experiment in a solution and in silico means obviously on a computer chip. So it's um, it's uh, it's a simulation. So obviously here we mostly talk about in silico because of what we're doing. And so we'll be doing we'll be mostly focusing on something called structured based drug design, which is very much oriented towards uh, computing of, of different values and so on. <clears throat> However, it's, it's worth to bear in mind that um, in vivo and in vitro is still massively what matters in, in, in drug discovery. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, I, have a, I have a quote that sort of explains it. Uh, it's from the Pfizer's global head of material science. Um, and obviously, material science is not exactly drug discovery, but uh, it, it's still relevant. And basically, it says that uh, you know one way to fast find the best compounds, and you can think of it as drugs, uh, is to make a large number of drugs or compounds and to measure their properties. And this is very time and uh, resource intensive. The other way is to predict what each of the compounds properties are and then narrow down uh, to just test the best ones. And this is really what we're trying to do. And what this presentation is about is looking at how we can predict and reduce the scope of which compounds or drugs we're gonna be testing. So uh, a few takeaways for today. Uh, obviously there's many more, but this is just for you to, just to bear in mind. Um, so the scope, for machine learning and quantum computing exist all along the drug discovery pipeline. And really there's, they're, they're very much needed technique to revolutionize the field. Uh, scaling uh, tends to be the constraining factor for classical methods. Um, and, and obviously that means that, you know, classical methods that we're using usually to compute the values that we are required to compute in, um, in, in drug discovery, uh, usually don't scale well enough. And so for very big systems, they, they're either too slow or not accurate enough. For machine learning, the constraint factor is going to be data. Uh, and it's a, it's a big problem across the industry is generating consistent and solid data. For quantum computing, we know it's, uh, it's hardware and it's still a few years down the line, but there's still hopes, you know, there's quite a lot of hopes that, uh, that it will be very useful. Um, in terms of obviously in vivo and vitro is cost and time. And I think that makes, that makes sense and it's quite uh, intuitive. Now, the last thing I want to mention is, uh, obviously, this is a conference about quantum machine learning. Um, most of the methods that we're going to talk about here are quantum computing rather than just directly quantum machine learning. There are some quantum machine learning, but most of the methods that we talk about are hybrid between uh, quantum and machine learning. So this is why it's, it's important to do this tension from the beginning. So we'll first look at an overview of the drug discovery pipeline, and then we'll go into each of the different steps. And from these steps, I'll give you examples of uh, machine learning and, and quantum computing. So let's talk about uh, what we mean by drug discovery pipeline. So the first thing you need to do uh, is uh, if you have a sort of virus or bacteria that you want to fight against, the first thing you need to do is to identify a target. And a target is going to be a protein uh, or a gene of that specific virus or drug uh, or, or uh, bacteria. And it's going to be a protein that has a, an important role in development of the pathogen. So for example, it will allow it to attach to a cell and so on. And what you're going to try to do is to jam that target by using a, a compound that will modify its behavior. Um, so that's what we call hit discovery, which is the second step in the drug discovery pipeline. Once you know your target, and to give you an example, if you think of a picture of a virus, for example, all the little spikes that you see here uh, outside of the, the picture of the virus, these are proteins that you could try to jam, for example. 
So in terms of hit discovery, what we're trying to do is once we know that target, we're trying to find a compound that can bind to it and modifies its behavior. And uh, and obviously that's obviously quite quite a tricky thing to do. And you're going to find a, a few compounds that work quite well, and you need to find the one that binds very strongly to the target. Uh, but once you find this, so sorry, just a quick picture here, so you can see that. Uh, uh, this is what we're talking about. We have a target, we have a ligand, which is another word for a compound or a drug. And, um, and you need to find a way that, uh, in a way for the, the ligand to stick to the target. Um, now, once we've covered these two steps, what we need to do is what's called lead optimization. So you'll find a lead compound, a lead ligand. And uh, what you're going to try to do is, uh, you know that it binds to your target, and you're going to try to find uh, what sort of externalities it might have on the body. And that means things like, uh, for example, is it toxic to other parts of your body? Does it metabolize too quickly uh, to be effective against a specific bacteria or virus? And so uh, this is a very iterative and important process to optimize uh, your, your compounds and shortlist them. So once this is done, then we can move on to animal and clinical studies. This is a very heavily regulated part of the industry. So step one to three are really much uh, the early stages of the drug discovery pipeline. And this is animal and clinical study as a main core of the, the process. It takes five to 10 years. And obviously we won't be covering it in this presentation because it's, 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 it's very much out of scope for us. So we're gonna start with targeted identification and um, I'm gonna present you briefly what he talks about and then we'll give you an example of uh, sort of machine learning and, uh, and quantum computing methods that have been uh, presented or proposed for, for this. So the first thing is define a drug target. It is a biological entity, usually protein or gene that interacts with and whose activity is modulated by a particular compound. So it's exactly what we talked about. And there's two aspects in this, uh, just to intro this, this section. The first one is it's obviously it's pointless if the protein in itself has no role in the pathology. So we need to confirm first that it has a role as uh, in the pathogen. That's mostly done in vitro and in vivo, so we won't cover it in detail here. Uh, but once you know this, uh, what you need to do to be able to, do, to perform computation on, on, this, on this target is that you need to confirm the structure of the target. So the structure of the target and of the structure of a protein uh, is the, way of pro the shape of the protein, and that determines uh, how it will interact with other uh, biological objects, for example, a drug. So it's very important to compute that early on in your process. So usually uh, what you have, which is very easy to do when you know what your, your target is, is you can compute uh, its components. So these are amino acids. They are very like, small uh, uh, sort of components, uh, molecular components of a protein. And they usually form a chain, which is called a polypeptide chain. And that's actually very easy to get experimentally. The problem is that then we need to compute the structure. And that's a lot more tricky because there is uh, a very largely exponential uh, uh, exponentially growing size of, of possible combination. And the structure will be the structure, the right structure will be the structure which will be the most stable. It's the one that has the lowest energy. And usually this is done by, uh, uh, it's done experimentally using things like X-ray crystallography or cryo-electron mi microscopy. The problem with these methods is that they require a lot of trial and errors and they usually take years to complete. And obviously they are very expensive. They're also very much context dependent, which means that the structure you find in a specific context might be completely different once in, it's in, in, in a living organism. Uh, there are computational methods to do it, and they mostly uh, are around trying to find uh, uh, and define the angles uh, between any sort of trials of these amino acids. And if you can find all the angles correctly, you can, uh, you can derive the structure. Uh, so now I'm gonna go through one example in machine learning and one example in quantum computing on how you can solve this. So the one in machine learning, and I, I bet some of you have already uh, sort of heard of this quite a lot. Um, it's AlphaFolds from, from DeepMind. So just in a nutshell, so it, it, basically there's a lot of computational methods that already exist for, uh, for computing the 3D structure of a protein. And every year there is a sort of a competition that happens, sort of critical assessment of protein structure prediction. And every year a team competes to produce the sort of the best uh, match for an unknown structure given a chain of amino acid. And over the last few years, AlphaFold has really sort of uh, completely uh, won over all the other methods by getting sort of 90% match against an unknown structure. So it's really sort of taken, given a new breath to the field of using machine learning to discover 3D structures of proteins. Uh, 
Uh, so it, it's obviously not a silver bullet. There are still, you know, constraint related to the fact that it's trained on experimental data. So it's constrained by the data that it, on which it is trained. And there are still corner cases on which it doesn't work quite well. Uh, but it still is a very huge advancement in the field and, and a very promising for the, for the years to come. Um, just very in a nutshell, I'm just going to tell you quickly how it works. Um, so what they do is that they first look at the chain of amino acids and based on the data that they have of other proteins, they predict the distance between each pair of amino acids. So they try to predict in a 3D structure what the distance of each of these amino acids are going to be. Then they separately predict the torsion angles between each sort of triad of amino acids, as we talked uh, previously. And from these two inputs, they try to then reconstruct a matching structure with the lowest possible energy for the, for the molecule. So that's been a very successful technique and very, very likely it will continue to be successful and be even better in the years to come. Now, this is something, a problem that has very much uh, sort of attracted the attention of the quantum machine learning and quantum computing technology. And sort of the main model that have been used in, in the literature for this is to use what's called a lattice model. Basically, the idea is that you start from a 3D lattice and you define a set of rules. Uh, and this set of rules is, for example, you cannot have two amino acids in the same uh, spot. You cannot have uh, your edges that sort of walk backwards and so on. And based on this set of rules, what you're trying to do is try to find the lowest energy possible uh, of fitting your uh, your amino acid chain in this 3D lattice. So you can see that the picture here is a schematic at the bottom. So each dot will be a different type of amino acid. And you can see you can find sort of a self-avoiding walk into this lattice. So this has been done uh, on uh, a quantum annealer. It's a problem that lends itself very well to quantum annealing. Um, but it's also done using sort of quantum machine learning technique of variational methods, uh, such as the, the QAOA algorithm and something like the uh, a, a slightly different versions of the variational quantum Mikan solver. Now, a lot of uh, sort of criticism related to this method is that the fact that the 3D lattice structure is quite rigid. Uh, but that said, despite this, there's it's it's quite a promising method because uh, you can use this lattice model, uh, this model that you get initially as a starting point for uh, for other simulations and uh, and uh, sort of more computation on on a more accurate uh, definition of your protein structure. Uh, now, there's another method that I haven't talked about here, which is called QFold. If you're interested, just Google it. You'll find it very easily. It's another method which uses uh, a quantum uh, a quantum walk to compute the 3D structure of proteins, and that use uh, an initial guess, which uh, could be, for example, the output that you get out of AlphaFold. So this is where we can see that you can get uh, very good, uh, very quick results, not necessarily perfectly accurate, very quick results, and not perfectly accurate results from machine learning method, and then use quantum computing to produce a, a more accurate and detailed, uh, detailed version of this uh, of the system. So now that we've identified our target, uh, we need to, and that we know the structure that it has, we need to uh, find a compound that actually binds to it and reacts to it. That's called uh, hit discovery. So I'm just going to do one small bracket here and talk about in vitro because uh, what's called high throughput screening is the gold standard of, uh, of the industry for hit discovery. So it is an experimental process by which you, you test a very large number of compounds rapidly and usually using robotics. And you, then you sort of, like in a genetic algorithm, you would just pick the best one, modify them a little bit and try again. Um, so it allows to test thousands and thousands of compounds at the, time, at the same time and progressively produce a lot of data and then optimize them uh, over time. Um, so despite this, I mean, it's, it's a very well-working technique, but it still is very time consuming and very, uh, very expensive. So if you can reduce this, uh, these requirements and reduce the number of compounds you need to test, that's a huge advantage for, uh, be a huge advantage for the industry. And so there is um, a lot of work in trying to do it in silico. And these are sort of two methods which called docking and scoring. Docking uh, is a computational method that predicts the orientation of a ligand or a drug um, within a target receptor. And so what you do with this is that you estimate, uh, so you predict how the ligand binds to the target, but also you estimate uh, what's called the scoring, you use a scoring function to estimate how much, how strong this, bind, this binding is, so how much energy is uh, is used to create this, this binding. 
So here we go. So docking is, uh, you have the picture that you already saw before. Uh, docking is to estimate the shape and the position of the ligand. And you use your normally, and classically we use uh, methods such as molecular dynamics or genetic algorithms. These are methods that work quite well, but the problem is they're very expensive computationally. And because of that, there is like certain type of system which are very difficult to assess accurately for sort of docking and, and getting the estimate. Uh, so we can also do uh, scoring. So scoring is once you know uh, which position the ligand has, you will ch check how much energy the combined structure will have. And then uh, that will tell you how strong the binding is, which is very important to selecting the best compound. Um, this also use uh, as a lot of sort of computational chemistry methods attached to it. So things like force fields, semi empirical methods. But again, we still have the same problem with these classical methods is that they do not scale well. You're, you're, again, you're trying to model uh, a quantum system using classical computing. And obviously it's, it's an exponentially growing problem. And so as a result of that, uh, these methods are just not uh, perfect for, for what we're trying to achieve. So there's been a lot of attention in the machine learning community uh, for solving this problem. So I'm just going to describe at a high level sort of the, the way system works. Um, usually you will start with the 3D coordinates of your target, uh, as we talked about. You will get the th 3D coordinates of your, of your possible compounds. That's a lot easier to get because they're significantly smaller. And you'll just fit into your machine learning model to output your binding affinities. So basically you output how strong the binding is between, the, between these two. Um, and there's a bunch of models that have been used. The state of the art is, as you can imagine, from something that is you know, 3D, uh, 3D targets uh, and 3D, it's uh, 3D convolutional, convolutional neural networks tend to work very well. Uh, but other methods have been used uh, as well. I put them here if any of you is interested in like looking that a bit further. But like things like kernel ridge regression and random forests have been have been quite successful as well. The main challenge, though, is as I said before, is the data. Uh, so the problem is pharmaceutical companies tend to keep their data for very good reasons. So there isn't really a very consistent set of data available out there. Uh, there's been two, at least two noticeable initiatives. Uh, one is called PDB Bind, which is probably slightly older, and the other one is called Molecule Net, uh, which is attached to sort of an open source package to do this type of tests uh, called DeepCam. And both of the set, what they're trying, both of these data set, what they're trying to do is to uh, produce. Uh, a set of benchmark data for this type of this type of methods. So they're very good references. If any of you is interested in this field, to go and have a look at, and uh, and try to get some very solid data to test your models. So let's have a look at how the uh, quantum computing uh, community has been thinking about docking. So here I'm just going to present a research that has been done by actually Zanadu and uh, and another company called Protein Cure. and it's uh, a method that uses a quantum device to perform molecular docking. So for this, we need uh, a small definition first, which is the one of pharmacophores. So that's a very uh, um, unusual word, uh, but uh, basically pharmacophores are just small molecular groups. Uh, like you can think about a small group, which will be uh, an hydrogen donor or an hydrogen receptor and so on. And the reason why we group them together is because they are the groups that are responsible for the binding. So two of these groups can bind together and form a link between uh, uh, two molecules or a protein in a molecule. So what we can do is then we can rewrite our molecule into these pharma pharmacophores. So here you can see we have a ligand uh, with four different pharmacophores. And what we do is that we create a graph out of this. So each, uh, each, um, each pharmacophore is a node and, each, uh, and you create an edge that represents the distance, the, the sort of physical distance between each of them. Now you can do the same thing with the target receptor, which usually is a, is a lot bigger. And from these two things, what you can do is that you can create uh, what's called a binding interaction graph. And it's basically a graph which includes all the possible combinations between these two. So you take all the pharmacophores that can bind together and you create a graph with whether or not they can be linked together. And your task here is to find uh, in this graph to find the um, is to find the subgraph which is fully connected. So that means it needs to be fully connected to represent uh, the full binding, but it, the full binding of the of the ligand in the receptor, and which is the biggest possible, because the more binding there is, um, the stronger your binding is going to be, and the better you, the better uh, compound you're going to have. And so uh, the device that they used to do this is uh, a small photonics device, which has been designed by Xanadu, I think. And uh, basically, it's a device on which you can encode the graph that you're looking at, and you can sample from that graph. 
So you input a lot of uh, photons into that graph. It's a photonics device. And what it does is that it sample graphs out of, uh, out of all the possible uh, subgraphs that you can create from your binding interaction graph. And you can get a subgraph from there. And from there, you have an iteration to find a fully connected graph in there. And what you can do with this is find uh, the, max, the maximally weighted uh, graph with a very high probability. So you can, can sample through it and very quickly find um, uh, the, the, the most sort of the, the graph which has the, the, the highest number of binding points between your ligand and your target receptor. Obviously, that sounds simple when you have sort of four on one side and six for the, for the target. Uh, but you can imagine in real life, you will have probably 200 on one side and you know, two cells on the other, which obviously creates a very, very large number of possibilities and a very difficult task to compute otherwise. So uh, obviously scoring. So once you have found how your, um, how your ligand and your target bind together, uh, you need to check how much energy uh, this new system has. And obviously for this, we, uh, we can use a method such as the variational quantum eigen solver. I'm pretty sure you've heard about it uh, about a thousand times since the beginning of the conference. I'm still gonna go through it very quickly. Um, but anyway, so you will start from uh, an array of qubits, uh, which you can initialize in the way you want, and then you will apply a quantum circuit to it. Uh, so that's specific quantum circuit. You can design it the way you want, but what's important about it is that it's parameterized. So at the beginning, you will start from either an initial guess of the different parameters in your quantum circuit um, or, an in, or a random one. And then you measure your states, you compute the energy of the molecule, the, the energy of the molecule that you have, and then you can update iteratively your circuit up until you find uh, the array of qubits that represents the ground state wave function. So the wave function which has the lowest energy, so the electronic wave function which has the lowest energy for your molecule. So you can do that iteratively and you can find the energy of, for example, uh, um, uh, a, com a complex which is composed of your target and your, and your ligand. So obviously this is uh, near-term quantum algorithms. They are methods as well for full-term quantum computer, but I'm not going to brush through this because it's, there's, there's a lot of things to talk about. Um, and uh, there's a, it's, it's still quite a lot on the question. The variational quantum eigen solver is still sort of unclear whether it can outperform state-of-the-art classical methods. I think the main, uh, the, main, uh, the main sort of thought at the moment is that classical uh, computational methods tend to be faster than, uh, or at least scale the same way as the variational quantum eigen solver. Um, however, you might be able to get better accuracy on something like the victory. Obviously, this is all up in the air. A lot more research needs to happen before we can, uh, uh, we can uh, discuss this. Um, and obviously, the variational quantum eigen solver often thought, uh, sort of is subject to the same features and pitfalls as uh, the parameterized, any parameterized quantum circuits. Um, so as a result of that, it has a, a, a number of, of uh, constraints as well. So once you know all these techniques, you can find your target. And from this, you can find uh, a bunch of uh, ligands that binds to your target. And so what you need to do from these ligands that you found, from the hits that you found, is uh, optimize them. So these hits are now called leads. And I know it's very confusing. They all have a lot of different names. But now they're called leads. Leads is a drug, a compound, a drug candidate. And what you're going to try to do is optimize them. So the process is uh, lead optimization, is the process by which a drug candidate is designed after an initial lead compound is identified. And really what you're trying to do here is to avoid externalities on, um, on other biological systems. You want to avoid that, for example, your the drug that you produce might be toxic for specific parts of uh, the body or and so on. So the way it's done is usually very much so in vivo, in vitro, so through experiments, and it's an iterative process as well. Um, you try to approximate the impact that it might have uh, on other biological system, then you update uh, your your compounds up until you find one that is the most, for, well, a series of compounds which are the most promising. Um, there are important metrics here, which are called the ADMET metrics, so absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And these are a sort of absorption, for example, absorption of the compound in the body, whether it's well absorbed, uh, it's distributed throughout the body, does it metabolize too quickly to have an impact on, on, the, on the body, and so on. There's another one called toxicity, which is usually separate, and toxicity is whether or not it has the potential of being poisonous for, uh, for humans in particular. Um, so obviously, as I said, it's done a lot in vivo, in vitro, but uh, it's a field of drug, drug discovery pipeline that is very much data-driven. 
uh, because obviously you cannot really test the toxicity on you know human beings directly. So you got to have proxies that you can that you can estimate, and these proxies are data and so on. And so the field has very much rely on something called quantitative structure activity relationship, which is basically looking at the correlation between the composition of a compound and the risk of toxicity or the risk of like too fast metabolism and so on. So it lends itself very much to machine learning. And so I'm just going to describe very quickly how it works in general. Um, and then we'll move on to a quantum example. So you will start with a 2D molecular graphs of your compound. And from there, you're going to extract what's called descriptors. So descriptors are sort of abstract features about these molecules. It could be, for example, the number, the atom types that you have in this molecule, the rings. So rings is a carbon ring. So if you see the, the C2, C7, C6, and so on, this is a ring. Uh, how many rings you have? What is the maximum size of the ring? And you can have more complex ones, like for example, the topological surface of your of your molecule. So from these descriptors, what you're going to do is that you can try to attach them to uh, admit admit properties. And these are things, for example, the impact on human liver function, uh, bioavailability, or for example, whether a molecule can cross the blood-brain barrier, so and so on. So once you have this together, well, you can start using your machine learning model to do that. And I found a, a quite nice summary that I wanted to share here, which is done by uh, Byers. So it's a you know, huge pharmaceutical company, and obviously they use these techniques a lot. Um, and here you can see sort of a summary of their research. You see on the left-hand side uh, the admit properties that I was talking about, and right next to them, sort of these sort of more complicated words um, are the proxies that we're using. So these proxies, uh, the values of uh, the values of these metrics actually can tell us um, whether there's a risk of toxicity or absorption of or like fast metabolism and so on. And uh, you can see very quickly from this table how much the research has progressed between 2005 and 2019. Um, and, uh, and just to give you a, a few sort of hints as to the type of techniques they're using. So RF is um, a random forest, which is probably one of the most used uh, system for this type of, of, uh, of metrics. And uh, obviously a super victim, uh, super victim machine and uh, multitask uh, neural networks. So they tend to be the most successful uh, technique for this. And this is actually, now we can move on to quantum machine learning. And it's actually something that has, has received very little attention from the community. But I did find one paper, it's a very interesting paper, uh, which was uh, published recently, uh, where they use actually directly quantum machine learning to try to predict the toxicity of a compound. So they're using the parameterized quantum circuit that you're probably all familiar with uh, by now in the, in the conference. So you start with an array of qubits. And the first task that you have to do is to uh, encode your data um, your classical data onto a quantum state. So you use an encoder circuit. Uh, so you can imagine that uh, your uh, your classical data would be uh, the descriptors that we talked about, and you want to encode this on a, on a, on a quantum state. And then you use a, quantum, a parameterized quantum circuit that will serve as your that will serve as your as your sort of machine learning network. Uh, from there, you can measure and then uh, in look at how much it matches the, the targets, and then you can update it until you find a system which uh, a sort of a parameterized quantum circuit that works uh, well for uh, for the set of data that you have. And then you can use it, obviously, to predict uh, the, the toxicity of new compounds that are outside of your initial uh, training set. So in this study, they've used 221 compounds of their training set. Um, to predict toxicity, they've shown that uh, actually they can at least on a simulation match the performance of uh, an equivalent machine learning system for for this set, which is very promising. They tested thirteen different kinds of encoding uh, for the for the data set, and and they really much very much demonstrated that uh, the choice of encoding is critical to the performance of the of of the the overall um, method. Uh, so it's also a very promising technique. Um, which, um, which I'm very sure we'll see very much of in the, sort of the coming years in the, in the literature. So I'm done now. I'm just going to wrap up with a very quick conclusion. Um, so um, what we've seen is that there are three steps in the drug in the sort of the early drug discovery pipeline in which uh, there's a lot of possible prospects for uh, machine learning and drug discover and, and quantum machine learning. These are uh, target identification. Um, hit discovery and lead optimization. And throughout all of the three, we really see a pattern here, which is that machine learning is really here to 
speed up the computation. It's really a, a, a method that can be used to sort of speed up and move uh, tests away from the experimental part of the pipeline so that you can do more, much more on, on the computer and save you know, time and, and, and cost. Uh, quantum computing, on the other hand, it's still in its infancy. There's a lot of research that is required and a lot of progress in hardware that is required for uh, to make this work. But very importantly, uh, quantum computing is mostly focused on trying to find the most accurate result possible. And uh, and this is where sort of how these techniques later on will likely work together. So on that note, that closes my presentation, and I'll end over back to Nathan. Thank you very much, Jules. It's, uh... Great talk, and uh, I want to put a call out to the chat to send in all your questions for Jules about the connections between drug discovery, AI, and quantum computing. We'll look forward to seeing those. So I have a question. This is this is something that's always in the back of my mind. You see, mm -hmm. you see headlines like uh, we have alpha fold, protein folding is solved. Essentially, you mm -hmm. know, that's 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 the the headline that you see. It's obviously yeah. not the case. What what um, more needs to be? Well, so. It's it's not the case. You, you're entirely right. So if we think about if we think about AlphaFold, for example, um, first of all, uh, they can they can they can make a lot more research, right? AlphaFold has has been sort of disclosed uh, for about eighteen months now. Uh, you can imagine that sort of eighteen to ten years down the like sort of ten years down the line, they will have made a lot of progress, and and who knows whether they will have solved the the, the question of sort of protein folding. Um, but the truth is, is that it will very much uh, improve our understanding because even if you don't get a, a perfect solution, an, an initial guess is already much better than um, than not having anything. Um, and so as a result of that, uh, these are methods that are already very, very useful. Um, um, an, an, another point to raise on this is uh, I briefly mentioned, and I didn't put it in the presentation because it would have been too long, but I briefly mentioned something like the Q-fold algorithm, which is which use a, a quantum walk, basically, uh, which is a quantum version of a random walk uh, from an initial guess to find a better result. Um, and this is also where we see that sort of the technology can go, where you match first um, a machine learning algorithm, which gives you sort of a 99% match with what your true result should be. And then you have uh, another system, which probably, which possibly is based on a, on a quantum computer, and then uh, allows you to get sort of that last 1%. Um, but obviously, you know, this is speculation and it might be years down the line, but. Uh... So it's, that's, that's kind of how you see things playing forward in the future. If you think about the intersection of quantum computing and ML, that they're, they're always kind of working in tandem rather than competing against yeah. each other. Absolutely. They, they fulfill different purposes. So if you have a well-trained machine learning model, um, and I'll, I'll put a bracket to this, but if you have a well-trained machine learning model, um, your, quantum computer will your quantum computing will never be as, uh, as fast, if you see what I mean, but it might be more accurate. Uh, one thing that uh, is worth noting, though, as a bracket to this is obviously quantum machine learning, uh, where you use your quantum circuit as, as, a, as a neural network to um, uh, and, and your and, and your machine learning model. Obviously, if you have a, a, a fully well trained sort of quantum machine learning uh, system, well, you can have the speed that you would have normally on a on a, on a machine learning model. So, so obviously, uh, it's it could compete with with traditional machine learning methods. But again, you know, it's it's we already see uh, you know we already know at the moment there's already quite a lot of research that shows that quantum advantage using quantum machine learning um, will be restricted to specific uh, specific tasks specific type of data, specific type of encoding. And so we can perfectly see sort of a, a, a system in which, you know, machine learning and quantum machine learning work uh, in tandem for solving these specific problems. I, I approve of this answer. I quite often, I, I find that people focus too much on, you have to have this foil, you have to compare classical versus quantum. And in order for quantum to somehow be justified, it has to be better than classical computing at everything. And that's like saying, well, I have a hammer already, but uh, you know, a screwdriver isn't, you know, it doesn't beat a hammer at what a hammer does. So therefore I shouldn't invest in, you know, buying screwdrivers. Exactly. That's a very good way to put it. Different tools. Exactly. Cool. We're getting some questions from the chat here. So I want to make sure we call mm -hmm. those out. So do many labs in, in the medical field or in drug discovery, are they starting to get interested in quantum machine learning? Are they starting to even use it? So, uh, for the for the former, yes, um, we see a lot of interest from from very large sort of pharmaceutical companies, and and it's it's very much growing interest for sort of 
obviously machine learning has been interest for a while, but, uh, but for quantum computing. Um, obviously, there's, there's a few things that I, I can disclose, but we, we've been, we are working right now on, on different projects with pharmaceutical companies on quantum computing projects. Uh, that's for the interest. Um, in terms of the, in terms of the, uh, using it, um, obviously the challenge is that at the moment, the quantum hardware is not quite ready yet. And one of the, what these companies are doing is they're not so much you know, researching whether or not they can do it. They can do something useful with it now. What they want to do is, what they're trying to do is try to understand uh, years ahead where this, this, this uh, technology will have value for them or for the specific sort of pipeline for specific drugs they design. And the reason why they need to do this is because they need to stay ahead of the curve and they need to sort of plan ahead for, for their own sort of like expertise, a sort of team of experts and so on. And so, yes, there's very much an interest uh, from the pharmaceutical industry into quantum computing and quantum machine learning. It's great to hear that there's that all that interest, even if it's still at an early stage these days. So for me, I, I've often seen people making the claim that you, know, you need to use these really advanced tools for, for drug discovery because molecules are essentially quantum, right? They, they, they're fundamentally built out of atoms and atoms have electrons and there's different orbitals and so somehow fundamentally they're they're quantum mechanical so you need to use a quantum computer but as well we know that is the more you zoom out the more classical physics is completely valid description for you know, all the accuracies you might need so wh where do you think we draw the line between when drug discovery becomes a classical task versus a quantum task well i think there's i think there's there's sort of several layers here and and i think that um first and foremost drug discovery is is an experimental task. Uh, it's because ultimately, you know, you you want to know that it works in a living organism and that it doesn't destroy it and, and does the thing that it wants to do. Um, once you try to look at it from a computational perspective, um, you can, as you as you said, you can very much describe a lot of uh, systems using classical physics and using classical mechanics and and so on, and um, and. The, the trade-off is often going to be between using a brute force approach using quantum mechanics because they are sort of quantum system inherently and using a more sort of maybe a, a, like a slightly smarter approach where you try to uh, use the classical methods to uh, ignore the approximation that exists in the classical physics and that impact um, uh, and that impacts uh, what could impact your results and say, well, look, we can get 99% of the results using classical methods. There may be some bits of quantum that we don't get, but at least we can get it, uh, you know, a thousand times faster. And so I guess that the, the, sort of the frontier between the two is, uh, is speed versus accuracy, is whether you have, you know, thousands of compounds you want to test or you want to estimate the properties of, um, or whether you have one and you want to be absolutely sure that it's the right one. Um, so I think this is where sort of you draw the line between um, using sort of classical methods or using sort of more quantum-based methods. That makes sense. That's, so that answers your question. For sure. The, the more, you know, the more drugs you have to sift through, the more efficient you need to be about it. You look for the, the best tools that provide that, that little bit of advantage potentially. Hmm. So a question from the chat from IceCon13, he says, or she says, uh, the graph approach for finding the best binding sites is really interesting. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, well, I, I, I can, um, I can speak a bit more about it. I obviously would very, very much welcome you to go in and look at the paper. Um, so uh, the main author is uh, Leonardo Banki, and I think he, I think he works or used to work for Zanadu, so it should be very easy to, very easy to find. He was a speaker earlier today. Ah, okay, well, fantastic. Well, I, I, I hope you talked about this. So that maybe that's that's the uh, that's the thing you were talking about. Um, but basically, the 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 idea is that you can um, basically it's, it's what I said on the slide. I mean, I, I you know, expanding on, on a lot more will, will take quite a bit of time. But basically, the idea is that um, one of the things that uh, so quantum photonic device are very good for is um, something something out of untractable distribution. And in general, it is something that is very, um, is, is, is a very promising sort of aspects of quantum computing in general. If you think about all the quantum supremacy claims that have happened recently, there's one from Google and one from, a, from another uh, university in China. Um, uh, both of them are some, based on something. Uh, so you basically use your quantum computer or your quantum device to create um, 
a distribution which you would not be able to create on a classical computer because you have too many different metrics or too many different dimensions and you can sample from it very efficiently. And so that's the way the device works. And uh, the, the problem of sort of solving uh, a fully connected graph within, within uh, like the, the largest fully connected graph into a wider graph is, is a very sort of long dated pro problem. It's NPR. You cannot solve it exactly on using classical methods. You need to use heuristics. There are tons of heuristics that already exist for this. Um, and so obviously whatever quantum device we produce will have to compete with this. Uh, but the advantage of the, of the sort of Gaussian uh, boson sampling, and obviously boson refers to the fact that we're using photons as, as, uh, um, as a sort of a quantum object, a quantum information object. Um, uh, the main advantage that it has is that it allows you to actually sample directly from uh, from a distribution which would be intractable to create on the, on the classical computer. So that's the reason why you could get an, a quantum advantage out of this. Obviously, uh, you know, it's a very early stage and, and there is a, a lot to be um, made on the technology sort of to develop it further. Great. And I know we have uh, one of the co-authors of that paper in the chat right now, Xfodap. So if people have any more quick questions, I'm sure he's also able to jump in and provide some, some clarity there. Fantastic. All right. We've got a couple more questions here. Uh, I'll ask this one. I'm not actually sure what it means. So maybe you know this terminology better than I do, but did you experience model under specification? Uh, and this is uh, where you have a model with the same accuracy, but different real performance in the real world. Uh, no. Um, well, I haven't um, personally because I'm more on the on sort of the on the quantum side than I am on the machine learning side at Raco. So I have not I've not been working um, uh, I've not been working on on this. Uh, but um, so obviously I'm not very familiar with this, and and, and there's, there's not much that I can I can disclose as well on on the work that we're doing at Raco in that respect as well. But but what I what I want to say is that. Uh, this very much relates to, I think part of the question very much relates to the reali how realistic the data you have to begin with. Um, and, uh, and I guess, you know, as I mentioned, one of the, one of the main challenge in, in drug discovery is, is uh, getting the right data. If you want to build machine learning applications on it, is getting the right data. Um, and, um, and, and there's several obstacles to this. One, one because the data is very, uh, you know, expensive to get. Uh, you need to conduct a lot of experiments, and and, and it takes quite a bit of time. Um, but another one is secrecy across the industry, and the fact that uh, even if it wasn't secret, uh, even if the data wasn't uh, you know um, protected, um, even then the data standards are completely different from one company to another. So you you will hardly be able to match the data set together. So as a result of that, you end up with um, a problem of transferability of your models between a model that you've trained on a specific data set that you might have had um, you know, somewhere in the wild and a more realistic one that you would get from the pharmaceutical company. Um, this is one of the main challenge of using machine learning in, in, in drug discovery, actually. And, uh, and there are a lot of people that are working to sort of trying to solve that problem. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, things like PDB bind or molecule net are sort of data sets which, which are trying to, to walk around this. So that's really interesting. I guess that's something that you wouldn't, you wouldn't really, it's maybe a subtle issue. You wouldn't really consider that at first glance, but uh, it's due to the fact that the companies have their own data sets and there's not this mentality of, of openness as traditionally in other fields. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So we have another question from Folded Protein. Uh, great name. Okay. Among, among the graph-based QMA methods in the electronic structure, quantum approaches like VQE, which do you think is more promising for quantum computing and near-term applications of drug discovery? So um, if, I, if I had to pick one, I think that uh, out, of, uh, out of all the ones that I've you know, seen and, and discovered, I think that uh, the one for molecular doping is very promising. I mean, there, there's a few challenges which are linked to the fact that, you know, your, um, the, the protein sort of folding and, 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 the, and the binding within the, within the protein is, is very much context dependent. And so as a result of that, you might not be able to get sort of the right answer from this type of methods. Uh, but it's a very promising one because it doesn't require too much from your quantum device. Um, if we think about something like the variational quantum eigen solver, um, they, they are at least you know, theoretical demonstration that uh, you could have an advantage out of this. And, and they're very, they're very solid, um, they're very solid uh, demonstration. Um, but one of the issue with something like the VQE is, uh, and, and it's, it's a big unknown, is the optimization problem. Uh, the opti and it's the same for most of the sort of parameterized quantum circuit, is how do you get to optimize your circuit um, 
once you have a, a very, very large molecule, which you try to find the ground state of. Um, and, and that is sort of a, it's, it's a big unknown because you cannot really test it and you cannot really derive um, an analytical argument for this, or a, a, at least a very solid one, because it's a heuristic in essence. And so, and so this is quite, I know there's quite a lot of research that is being done on this as well, but it's, it's, it's a big unknown for something like the variational quantum uh, eigensolver for the short term methods. Um, I talked about Qfold. I think Qfold is, a, I, I really like this paper. I strongly recommend anyone interested to go and read it. Um, the problem with Qfold is that it's not a near term quantum computing methods. It's a very much a fault tolerant quantum computing methods. It relies on something very similar to a Grover's search. So it's years and years down the line, but it's a very interesting paper, very interesting method as well, which maybe, you know, extensions of it in a few years might be very promising. Great. Thank you very much. We, we probably don't have too much more time for any questions from the chat, but I did want to take some time to actually get to know you a bit better and get our, our audience a chance to get to know you and your company as well. So your, your employer is, is Racco. Um, you know, it's a startup based in, in, in Europe. What can you yeah. tell us about it? Yeah, well, look, uh, so Racco is, uh, I think that I've thrown a few hints throughout the presentation, but Racco is, uh, we're aiming to be a, a molecule factory. And that means that we really want to be able to uh, develop and create all the tools which are um, necessary to go from, um, you know, an idea about what a molecule should be doing, all the way to um, designing this molecule, you know, in in the at least on the computer. And that involves a number of methods, uh, generative models uh, or machine learning models to predict um, the, the properties of a, of a molecule. And so we're looking at the whole pipeline. We are focusing on a machine learning method, which are very much inspired from our knowledge of quantum physics and quantum computing. And on the other hand, we also look at so method that can be applied today. Uh, and we're already working with some clients on these specific methods. And on the other side, we also do uh, quantum computing research. And there's two reasons why we're doing it. The first one is because it's a very good way to get inspiration for new machine learning methods, but also because it's a very much future proofing for, uh, for this specific technology, because we want to know and be able to develop the specific tools which are required uh, when quantum computers are available for uh, drug discovery in general. So that's pretty much what RACO is about. Um, if anyone will know, RACO is actually the name of a, of a Nordic European uh, god who manipulates the phases of the moon. So the reason why the name is given to the company is because, you know, um, the research initially was focused on, you know, mostly quantum computing and um, obviously we're trying to manipulate the phases of the qubit. So that's that's where the name comes from. That was that was my, my immediately next question. Uh, I, I, I was anticipating it, so I just went ahead. That's a really cool name. Thanks. So, um, Jules, I, I heard there's an interesting story. You're you're quite a traveler, and you've you've got some some quite long trips in your in your backlog. And one one in particular I want to ask you about because I've taken the same trip. One of our other guest speakers yesterday mentioned the same trip, same trip. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, and that's yeah, the yeah. that's the yeah. the Trans, Trans Siberian Railroad. Yeah. So, what yeah. can you tell us about that experience? Well, uh, what I can tell you is that um, it's completely different to what I expected. Um, uh, maybe it was naive of me, but I, I was expecting to be cold in Siberia, uh, but we did it in the middle of summer and, uh, and it was about 35 degrees on average throughout the whole trip. Um, now, you know, I was, I was, you know, a bit younger and, and not so sensitive to comfort, um, and at least not as much as I am today. Uh, but you can imagine that, uh, being stuck in a train without AC at 35 degrees outside, uh, for, a, you know, a 38 hour, uh, drive without brick. Is is not exactly the most comfortable experience, um, so that was that was enduring. But at the same time, um, uh, it was a very interesting. Uh, it was a very interesting trip. Um, you get to meet a lot of very interesting people, and to the extent that we can communicate with them, but it's usually not too difficult. And you get to see a lot of different uh, cities and cultures uh, throughout a single trip, and it's 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 very interesting. I would definitely recommend doing it. Um, just you know, be careful that uh, if you are uh, exigent about your comfort, just make sure you get first class tickets on the train. Um, Which class did you go in? Oh, I was uh, probably some of the lowest one. Um, the third class, the Platz Carney? So there is the, no, I wasn't. So there's, there's, I think the lowest class is uh, a full train of wagons where you have um, 
a, a, a full a full coach in which you have all the tra- all the, the beds together and it's a sort of a big we didn't go that far we had a cabin we've sort of shared with a uh, sort of a six people cabin so i think it's the it's the lower second class i think if i remember correctly it's something like 2b or something like this mm. Amazing. Uh, I remember I took that trip maybe 12 years ago, and my biggest memory is uh, in Beijing. Oh, sorry, not Beijing. It starts in Moscow. So in Moscow, these two Russian guys got on, and they had this gigantic bag of sunflower seeds. And they just sat at a table for like 30 hours, just going through those sunflower seeds one by one. They they knew what was coming. <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, it's it's surprising how long you can spend on a train without stopping. Um, but you know, um, all right, Jules. To to wrap up here, I'd like to to take a chance to have a little fun and play a little game with you. This is, uh, I think, the first time we're going to play this particular game. It's called okay. it's called real or imaginary. And I'm going to give you a, a word or a phrase, and you're going to have to tell me whether it's something that's truly real in the quantum community or it's something that I just made up. Oh, or wow. something. <laughs> So you just have to say real or imaginary. I think this is going to be quite challenging. Uh, there's a lot of sort of very out there concepts. So, all right, let's 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 get started. This will be fun. Yeah. So, let's start easy. Convolutional neural network. Well, that's real um, in the machine learning community. Um, it's usually used for sort of uh, you know image based machine learning methods, so visual based those of computer vision. Right. Uh, correct. I'll give you partial points that because I, I said convolutional neural network instead of con. Ah, convolutional. Oh, sorry. Convolutional. Uh, well, I've never heard of it, but I'm pretty sure someone will have come up with something like this. So is it is it a real thing? That is the real thing. There's a paper titled "Convolutional Neural Networks." Fantastic. All right. Here's one for you. I should read it. Yeah. Go on. Q continuum. Q continuum. Hmm. Well, I have no idea. Um, uh, I'm going to say that it is imaginary. It doesn't exist. That is correct. It is imaginary. It is from okay. Star Trek, the next generation. It is an extra dimensional plane of existence inhabited by a race of beings known as the Q. Great. So see, I thought I had heard it somewhere, but I couldn't match it to anything. So I was mm, doubting a little bit, but that makes sense. All right. Here's one I think you should be able to get, I hope. UCCSD. Well, UCCSD, yes, it's uh, it's an ansatz for variational quantum eigensolver, uh, which means unitary couple cluster single and doubles, and it refers to single and double excitations for your molecule. Spot on, spot on. All right, one more, one more here. Okay. Ulan Batar. Well, okay, so that it's not really part of the quantum world. Well, I guess it is because everything is, but uh, uh, it's the capital of Mongolia. Um, and it's a very interesting city. Um, strongly re- recommend uh, going there if, if you have any sort of uh, uh, need a tip for a restaurant. I know a fantastic Italian restaurant there. So there you have it. You can get your best uh, Italian tips if you're ever wandering around the capital of Mongolia from Jules. Exactly. Perfect. Well, it's been very fun to have you with us today. I'm going to conclude here and uh, thank you very much for speaking with us today. And Thanks we'll get to our time. next. Thank you very much, Jules. We'll get to our next speaker in a few minutes. We'll be right back. Thanks again, Jules.